Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Nosoitha, and welcome to the first museum talk of the 2022 season. I'm delighted to say that this evening, here in the UK, we are linking up with another former Glamorgan cricketer who's now resident in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's a very good evening, Nosoitha, to former Glamorgan wicketkeeper, Terry Davis. Good evening, Terry. How are you? Good evening, Andrew. You look, and you're looking marvellous. Oh, Terry, that's good. But I can see from the light coming in through your window, uh, <laughs> it's not good evening. So um, where are you and what's the time there? I'm in the South Island of New Zealand uh, and it's 8am 8, 8 Friday morning. Oh, wonderful. Um, what we're going to do this evening in the usual way is we are going to be having a nice little chat and um, you can see here that I've got some slides. There's a certain similarity, Terry, there. Maybe the moustache, um, the moustache has disappeared. But, um, well, what's, hap what, what's happened to me? Where's that uh, dark hair and massive hair and... Uh, but uh, the, no lines on my face. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. One is 90s, the other is 80s. Working Ooh. together on the team. Well, if I could ask the people who've just joined us, if you could mute yourselves, please. I shall miss his phone calls. He phoned sometimes every day of the week. I can get rid of my landline now. He's the last person to use it. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Terry, it's. A lovely good evening here from um, South Wales. It's um, it's just a turn of seven o'clock here in uh, Wales. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about your county career. We're going to talk about your professional career as a cricketer, both in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And we're also going to be uh, looking at your more recent work in sports administration, sports marketing. And I know where you are in South Island, you've got a massive job and we'll hear about that a little bit later. Um, I do apologize, Terry, for this next. So- Ouch, ouch. Ouch, there you are. Um, so- I Look about 10. Oh, well, okay. So born in 1960, St. Albans in Hertfordshire, and I think I'm right, Terry, by saying that you were very much um, at heart uh, a keen footballer as well as a cricketer. Yes, that's true, Andrew. I think uh, football was probably my first love. Uh, uh, not so much these days because in the Southern Hemisphere, we, it isn't uh, a core a sport. But certainly in my young days, uh, I loved it and I trialled with a number of professional teams, but it was never tall enough, it was never fast enough. And uh, I think I was always doomed to fail as uh, in pursuing a career in, in football, to be fair. What but, position? But played, but played county and played, I think, played South England. And, uh, and I, I started uh, 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 in midfield and ended up uh, uh, in the back line, the fullback. Okay, so who were your who were your heroes then in, oh, look, in, in I, I a loved, football? I loved West Ham, Andrew. I loved the Hammers, uh, the Trevor Brooking days, uh, phenomenal. So any of the West Ham players in those early days, uh, I just uh, loved. Okay, well let's let's talk about your your cricketing heroes. We'll talk in a minute about your time on the MCC ground staff. But growing up, growing up like me in the late 60s, early 70s, who were your, who were your cricketing heroes? Oh, without a shadow of doubt, I remember days where uh, in summer when we were uh, school holidays, sitting in front of the television with those old school books, you know, the, uh, the green school books, uh, marking down every run that was scored during those uh, test matches uh, and 
without doubt, Alan Knott would have been the absolute pinnacle hero for me. Um, uh, just his red gloves as, as a kid, the red gloves, the quirkiness of him and that uh, sun hat that he flipped back. Uh, he was he was just a legend. OK, did, did you ever get to meet him or not? I did. I mean, you know, when you talk about moments and memories uh, and step change, when you when you first get into first class cricket and you and you have to pinch yourself when you get selected because not only are you uh, on the same field, you're sitting in the dressing rooms talking to heroes like Alan Knott, Bob Taylor, uh, Paul Downton, you know, Bruce French, Jack Richards, all those guys that, you know, before you got in, into to playing first class, you're watching on television. And, you know, as you walk out to the middle when you're batting, you turn around and look back and there's Alan Knott doing all those things with his pads and flicking his hat and he's there and you're there and it's a little surreal. So uh, very fortunate to have had Bob Taylor and, and Flea, Alan Knott, uh, it, right at the start of my the time. And it was always, they were always giving of their time, Andrew. You, I'd always, during a match, say, you know, uh, Alan, can you, after the game, can you just give me a rundown and uh, give me some tips? And they'd always come down. I remember Alan Knott at, at Canterbury one day. I, I, I didn't have time to follow up to go and see him afterwards. And he came down with a towel around his waist and said, Terry, come on, I'll, I'll give it, come on, I've got five minutes for you. And he came and sat in our dressing room and gave me a rundown on, uh, his thoughts and my performance during that game. So uh, lived up to all my expectations of greatness, that, that man. Great. Well, I must say, with a surname like Davis, are there any Welsh connections? My father, well, my father was raised in, uh, in Wales and I have family in Thethy still. So uh, the, the, uh, that part of the world is, was always, uh, I grew up there, was taken there as a child. And I remember having trials with, uh, Surrey at the time, when I was on the MCC ground staff uh, with Glamorgan, I was playing second level cricket with Glamorgan and Surrey took interest. My father said, don't even think about it. You're going to play for Glamorgan. So it was a, it was a, uh, there was, there was a no contest in our family that uh, the Welsh candy was always going to take preference. Of course. <laughs> That's perfectly <laughs> natural, Terry. So, Absolutely. Um, am I right in thinking that around about 1977, 78, you joined the um, the MCC ground staff. I did. I had a I had a an incredibly supportive uh, teacher at the time, uh, David Cooper, who taught geography and was a cricket nut. Uh, and he he uh, was in control of our school team, and he had he had great promise for me. And I remember him uh, saying one day, "I've I've contacted uh, Len Munzer, who was the then uh, head coach of the MCC Young Cricketers, and he said, I've got you a trial.'" Uh, and I think it was in Finchley uh, where they were running trials uh, at this time. And, and I remember the first person I met at that trial was Jeff Holmes. Because oh. Jeff was at that same trial with me, uh, with his father and my father. And we got on like a house on fire. And it was nice that we could um, move through the ranks and play first class cricket together. And, and Jeff and I, I'm sure we'll talk about Jeff later, but Jeff and I, then were roommates for quite a, a, a number of years when when I was playing first class. Yeah, yeah, a, a, a wonderful man and um, still deeply missed here at um, Sapphire Gardens. For those people who uh, haven't uh, joined us before on the talks, I'm speaking here from the uh, museum here at uh, Sapphire Gardens in Cardiff. And uh, I'm glad to say, and Terry would approve that there are some photos in the museum of uh, not only Jeff Holmes, but another great man of Glamorgan cricket, John Derrick, who, uh, yeah. who played a, a key role in the 1980s and in subsequent years in the development of, yeah. uh, of so many of our rising stars. Now, you just mentioned Len Munzer there. Uh, yeah. Terry, there he is as yeah. uh, Lord's coach. So um, what, did he, uh, what did he say? Because you were, forgive me for saying, your wicket-keeping was your number one forte, your batting was your second string. Yes. Uh, so what did Len say to you? Work hard. Get, in, ensure that you've got two strings to your bow. <laughs> so we worked really hard at uh, uh, when I was on the ground staff at, of course, nurturing and improving your uh, skills behind the stumps, but uh, improve your batting and work really hard outside. So Len was a great... Uh, leader of the, of us, 
uh, he had a lovely style about him where, you know, you, he, he was kind, but he was knowledgeable and he pushed you when he needed to push you. And he was he was a good guide for me. And certainly when uh, I was starting to play second level cricket for Glamorgan, he was very helpful, of course, with his with his experience to the county. But no, a great, a great leader for us at, at Lords. Yeah, and I think around just after, or maybe in your final year at Lords, there was another uh, player who only had a brief career with uh, Glamorgan, a spin bowler also. Uh, Surrey took an interest, Neil Perry, or was yeah, Ziggy. 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 Yeah, Ziggy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Zig. He was, uh, and he was a good cricketer, Zig. Uh, he came on uh, right at the tail, if not just after I was playing second eleven cricket. But uh, during my time MCC cricket, I think we had Norman Cowens, who went on to play for England, Asif Din, who played for Warwickshire. There was a number of decent players amongst uh, the, the group of uh, lads that were on the staff at the time. Yeah. And as an MCC ground staff person, what were your roles? It wasn't just playing, was it? Well, it wasn't very glamorous in those days, to be fair. I mean, nurturing, it was, a lot, it was like a true apprenticeship. Uh, you, you went in and you had your day where there were uh, nets and training, but then you, were, you, were, you had to uh, 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 fall in line when there were first-class matches at Lords or test matches and run duties. So the duties were either working in the scoreboard or in the pavilion and servicing members around matches. So it was a, there, there was a little bit of work to be done around uh, the actual uh, training of skills. And the matches you played not only against uh, aspiring professionals, but you were playing against school teams and other clubs, yes? Yeah, it was a very eclectic mix of teams you played against, whether it was MCC members' teams or schools. or It was a, a quite a range of different uh, standards. But it, 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 the, the reality about it was it was a good feeding ground for the system uh, and it gave us a chance to uh, understand what it was like to on a daily basis, get in, get your head around practice and training and uh, and developing skills, which is uh, which was important. Yeah, I suppose really what we're talking about is an apprenticeship, and D yeah, exactly. Was still, yeah, exactly, pure apprenticeship. And uh, you know, it was it, it's a very competitive. I mean, you you know, and you and I know how competitive it is, but it it it, it did certainly give an edge. Because as you and I know, skill really and talent is only probably about 20% of making one a, a, a player, uh, getting a player through the system. It was all about, it's about hard work, commitment and how you apply yourself and all of those things that probably are not dissimilar to the business world. And so it gave a good grounding for those skills. So in 1979, here you are making your... Glamorgan debut. Um, yeah. I don't know whether, did you have a full contract or were you on a summer contract then? In I was Saturday? on summer contract. Yeah, summer contract then. And uh, it was a bit scary getting uh, selected because in the first team, I've got to have a long memory here, but, you know, I joined in that team. I think there were players, you know, of course, uh, Malcolm Nash was in there, the Jones boys uh, around, but I, I took Ivy on spot for that game. Uh, you had Peter Schwartz, uh, Schwartz, I think, from South Africa. There was, yeah. uh, there was who played that game? Andy Mack. I'm just trying to drag my memory. Yeah, we'll back see here. some. I've got some photos of those uh, oh, good. in a minute, okay, yeah, Terry, good. just to just right. to remind you. Yeah, but, yeah, no, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself, but it's no, a, no, it's no, a good no, memory. no, 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 good memory. It's great. It was a great, it's, great memory. Yeah, yeah, but your your first class debut there, as you said, Ivy and uh, Ivy and Jones, who'd been the first team keeper really since 1968, was uh, taking a little bit of a breather. And you played against Sri Lanka at Swansea, also making their debut, I believe, was um, was Greg Thomas. Yes. And also uh, someone who may well be more associated with Hampshire as well as England, but it was Chris, or as I think everyone knew him, Kippy Smith. Um, yeah, Kippy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think Kippy had played a lot of second team cricket with you, Terry, hadn't he? He had. Uh, he was a fine player, uh, Kippy. Uh, he was he was piling on the runs in in second eleven cricket. But yeah, you're right. I, I'd forgotten that Kippy played that game. It was his first one. Yeah. Yeah, and Greg as well as a. I think he was just just out of school, a raw schoolboy. We'll talk in a bit more detail about yeah, yeah. Um, fast bowlers in a minute. But have you got any have you got any memories of that debut against the Sri Lankans 
at Swan. Oh, I, I, I think I think it was a blur. I think the, the things you remember are, are not so much on field. I think the the memory you have is the excitement of getting selected and the disbelief probably of getting selected first, and then secondly, the the awe when you go into a dressing room and you, you know you're looking around the dressing room with all those. Uh, great players, those heroes, and uh, trying to pinch yourself to say, am, am, I, am I actually here? So those are the sorts of memories. You, the, the, the match and what happened is sort of a blur. Um, at the time, of course, in the Glamorgan second team, we'll see in a minute their photos. There was Kevin Lyons as captain and Phil Clift as coach. Yeah, yep. Were they the ones who told you you were playing? Uh, they did. Uh, I think it might have been KJ. I can't remember who actually told me. Probably it was probably KJ who would have uh, uh, told me. Um, but it was—it's a blur because you know you, you don't expect to get picked. And gosh, trying to get Ivy on out of that, uh, out of the gloves off him would be—it's—you'd it, had to saw his arms off to get those gloves off. So it was a—it was a rare opportunity for me to get out on the paddock because uh, Ivy was just. Uh, he was just a regular fiction. You, know, I, I, I never thought I'd get a game, to be honest. Yeah, and uh, obviously, Ivan, right you were yeah, there he is. You were um, you were acting as his understudy there in the background, of course, Terry. There's the uh, yeah. there's the lovely shed that used to be here at Sophia Gardens. I can remember. Right. I can remember as a schoolboy sitting in there, and um, yeah. but um, let's just talk about Ivion because. Um, as a wicketkeeper, I remember sitting here during this during the 1970s watching Ivy and keep, and very rarely did he miss a chance. Uh, a supreme gloveman. Did he give you Terry any any tips as understudy? Oh, look, I think uh, to be fair, we, we were sort of passing in the night, but whenever I, you know, to be fair with me with him, is that he was the consummate professional for me. So. You know, when you watch a bloke like Ivion, who was that older style of player, he, you're right, he, he, uh, he was solid. You know, he was the sort of guy who you know is going to take chances. He's never going to let you down. Was likely to get you out of trouble with the bat as well. You know, he was just one of those guys that was you never thought would... He, he was never see him understated but faultless. So, and, and so was, for my learning for him was watching how... He mentally managed himself uh, in preparation and, and on the ground uh, and how he went about his business. So that was more learning for me than it was, a, a, say, a chat off the field. But always always supportive uh, uh, and, uh, again, but but hungry. He was never going to give his place up and always wanted to play, and quite rightly so, because he was, uh, he was, he was, he was one of the best that's, that's uh, stood behind the stumps uh, for the county. Absolutely. I mean, his record speaks for itself. And, um, exactly. It's... It is amazing to think that um, later this year, Ivian will actually be celebrating his 80th birthday. I stress, Terry, 80 not out. So Yeah, uh, good. A... And I'm surprised he hasn't got the gloves on still, to be fair. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you mentioned your contemporaries in the uh, Glamorgan yeah. side. Now, I should say this yeah. photo was taken. Uh, Alan and Ivian weren't there on this uh, particular day. But if we look at the front row, yeah. uh, we can see some real characters there. If I yeah. go from left to uh, right, we've got Rodney Ontong, Mike Llewellyn, Peter yeah. Swart in 1979, Robin Hobbs there That's as it. captain, yeah. Tony Cordell. Speedy, speedy. Yeah. John Hopkins and Gwyn Richards, very yes, much speedy. there, the senior players. On the back row, far mm. left, John Derrick, who we mentioned earlier on, yeah, alongside yeah. John is a, a young trialist called Michael Thornton, who actually didn't make the grade. But um, next to Michael is Jeff Holmes, yeah. who Terry, yeah. you just mentioned. Yeah. And another guy called uh, Knight, Robert Knight, who uh, came down from Mid Wales, again, didn't actually uh, make the grade at first team. Andy Mack there, yeah. six foot nine, I think he was, uh, Terry, ex policeman Ziggy or Neil Perry, and then moving along, Mark Davis, Arthur Francis, and Alan Jones. And as I, uh, Alan Lewis Jones, okay. AL. But of course, we have Alan Jones and Ivan Jones who were indisposed when this, this photo was taken. But Terry, happy days, some, some great colleagues there. Great characters. I mean, Ponty at the front, what a character and a, good, a great stalwart for Glamorgan. 
Speedy, uh, swung it, uh, Hobbsy. Uh, he was a character, Hobbsy. Uh, uh, Mike, good player. So if you look at, when I look at that, you know, when I look at my career in Glamorgan, there was always a band of those stalwart players like the Joneses and uh, Malcolm Nash and probably Speedy at the time. Then there was a band of players who were fine players who, who were in and out, like Mike Llewellyn, uh, A.L. Jones, Arthur Francis, uh, that were sort of always in transition and never really cemented their spot. Uh, and they were fine players. And I look at Rodney, who probably during his time should have played higher honours, pr probably. I mean, he was a, he was a fine performer. Um, when he first started bowling swing, seam swing, then turned to off spin. Uh, but he, he, you know, his record is, is, is outstanding. Jeffrey, you know, Holmes was just a professional. You know, uh, you, 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 you know you, at times you'd question, did he have the skill? But God, he had the heart. And uh, he was a great performer he, and he was competitive. Uh, Andy, big left armour, used to run in and uh, try and bounce people out. I think he thought he was back in the police force and uh, trying to put a strangle on some of the batters. Ziggy was a uh, fine spinner, Zig. Uh, again, should have played a lot more. I thought he was a, he was a really good cricketer. Uh, yeah, so interesting, interesting bunch of mixed players and personalities. Yeah, I should have also said, as well as Alan and Ivy on, uh, Malcolm Nash wasn't available in this yeah. photo. They were, they were at a presentation elsewhere. So, uh, but... Um, it does give a flavour, Terry, as you said, of the mix of youth and experience that Glamorgan yeah. had at the time. Of course, Glamorgan had enjoyed a wonderful 1960s, 1969 yeah. winning the county championship. That's right. And then, of course, a rebuilding phase in the 1970s. We mustn't forget, of course, that in 1977, Glamorgan yeah. had reached the final, final. of the Gillette yeah. Cup and uh, under Alan Jones as captain. And uh, so the, the rebuilding was, was going on, but a mix of, um, as I say, a mix of youth and experience. Let's just talk there, um, Terry. Peter Swart, you just mentioned. Sadly, yeah. uh, Peter Swart passed away a few years ago, but yeah. as an all-rounder, a great competitor. Incredibly fierce. I mean, you know, uh, we've had some good overseas players, to be fair, but Pete was was up there. He was incredibly uh, competitive. And, Andrew, I'll, I'll go back to that 77 final, and just looking at Mike Llewellyn there. Remember him charging down the wicket and smacking, I can't remember what I mean, uh, Featherstone, I can't remember. No, John Embry. Embry. John, John Embry. Embry. He embers. He embers back over his head to six into long on or long off. And it was, he, his, I remember I was at Lords that day, and, I, and he was, his innings was pretty inspirational for me. I thought this is great because Glamorgan were always going in as the underdogs uh, and it was great to see them fight hard. Great. Well, um, if we just move on a year because there was someone else who was missing off that uh, previous um, photo because in 1980, Glamorgan second 11 win the second 11 championship and yep. they're holding the tray. Uh, someone, sadly, again, who's no longer with us, uh, another fine cricketer, another fine off-spin bowler, uh, very much the man who people thought was going to take over the mantle of Don Shepherd. But I'm talking there, the man in the centre of the photo holding the tray, but Barry Lloyd. Yeah, Terry, what, yeah. what do you remember about Barry? Oh, Barry, was a, he, he, was a, he was a gentleman, uh, Barry. He was a good leader. Uh, he was a good leader of men, uh, committed to the county, loved putting the daffodil on, uh, and he was uh, he was he was great uh, mentor for all of us. So he, he was a he was a great man, uh, Barry. I, I liked uh, playing cricket with 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 Baz. Yeah, we can we can see Barry there with uh, Phil Cliff sharing yeah, the uh, sharing now, the Andrew's, Andrew, is that Arthur? Arthur the score? I can't remember. Is it Arthur the scorer? No, no, it was Arthur. Ray, Ray, Ray. Ray. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ray, Ray, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm glad Ray you Ray. remember the names of the scorers, Terry. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just looking the... at there. I'm just looking there. There's uh, Mark Cohen as well. I remember Mark. Yeah, on the extreme on the right. right on the extreme yeah. right is Mark Cohen. Actually, yeah. um, I think he married. I'm not sure if she was Miss World. She was. Yeah. She was. 
Yeah, he was a, for those people who don't know, Mark Cohen there on the extreme right, a very talented cricketer from Ireland, uh, opening batter, but of course, as Terry was alluding to uh, at the time, Alan Jones and John Hopkins, so there were not as many opportunities. Hugh Morris, who we can yes, see there, third left as well, looking over Phil Cliff's shoulder. But Mark Cohen there, who possibly is more famous for being the husband of a Miss World. Um, I can see you there with Rodney looking over your shoulder with KJ. Right. Alan Lewis-Jones, another great man yeah. there in the middle. Tony Cordell, Speedy. Yeah, Speedy, yeah. Oh, what are your memories of Speedy, Terry? Oh, his character, character in the dressing room. Uh, I remember he was a pre prestigious swinger of the, of the cricket ball, great with the new ball, uh, but incredible character. Uh, uh, and you need those characters in your dressing room to lighten, lighten the place up. A, a great guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now um, resident in British Columbia in Canada. Yeah. He's yeah. just recently retired and uh, he's had a wonderful, wonderful career at, uh, at various colleges and schools on the west coast of Canada. And his role recently, ahead of the college games, is to sing the Canadian anthem. Now, I know... Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, Terry, um, I know that um, Speedy used to be quite a character singing in the showers. And singing, yeah, that's right. Singing as yeah. well when Glamorgan won. Oh, oh Happy yeah. Days and all the others. That's yeah? it. That's it. Yeah, now you lighten the dressing room up. I think uh, you would have seen him on some of these... Uh, 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 TV shows, uh, whether it's uh, uh, American Idol or wherever, I'm sure Speedy would have had a crack to try and get uh, get his name up in lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his wife, um, who was a nurse, had a wonderful opportunity to go to uh, the Vancouver area. Yeah. So when Speedy finished, the Cordell family went there, and as I say, Tony settled in. And uh, actually, Excellent. I'm hoping maybe we could do an, a museum talk with him, and he could he could sing on camera. Which yeah, would, he would be uh, really. definitely oh, well, he will he will <laughs> that would be wonderful. Okay, well we're going to move um, we're going to move on in terms of the uh, the years, and we're going to move now, Terry, to May yeah. nineteen eighty two. There you are with your Stuart Surridge jumbo That's over it. your this, shoulder. This yeah, yep, and alongside Sorry, you is a a Glamorgan yeah. cricketer, someone who only played very briefly but made quite an impact. Um, yeah. a seam bowler called Simon Daniels. Yeah. And um, Terry, you were making then, I think Ivian was injured. It's May yeah. 1982 at Swansea, at St. Helens. The game is against Gloucestershire. Yeah. And um, you and Terry, uh, sorry, you and Simon, I should say, you and Simon uh, are there in the middle and a wonderful last wicket a 10th wicket partnership, which still stands as a Glamorgan record. So yeah. uh, what are your memories of that, Terry? Oh, it was, it was, it was surreal, really. I mean, we were, Simon and I, Cads, I called him, but Simon was my housemate. So we lived together in Cardiff. And uh, this was my first championship match. Uh, so I was just absolutely uh, uh, thrilled to get a game. And I remember on that day, and you know, St Helens on Sundays, it you know, if it, it, the wicket improves as early on, it seems a little bit and improves, and that they'd, they'd knocked over early wickets. And all I remember is, I think we were one when I got in there, one sixty-seven or something for uh, for eight, and uh, we, I think Barry played, he got out, and Simon came to the crease, and I said, look, just get your head down, let's just try and fight our way through. And, and a few edges, a few nicks and nudges, and, and we were suddenly getting a partnership together, and the conditions got a little easier. And and, and as it went on, we, you know, we were starting to build a serious partnership. And I think he was on at the time. He'd got fifty, and I'd got uh, to fifty. And I remember going down the wicket to say to him, "I said, look, we can get ourselves a hundred here today, uh, both of us." And he said, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. And of course, not, Simon, of course, uh, you couldn't resist. Uh, the swashbuckling style that he had, and he ended up getting caught, uh, I think it was mid-off off of Phil Bainbridge, I think, or mid-on, trying to hit one over the top for six. But incredible experience. And one, it was my first championship match. My parents had driven down, and they were listening to it on the radio as they were coming down. So that was exciting for them. 
it was great to partner with my uh, housemate because we were great mates. Uh, and it was just a, a special day, you know, when you when it, all of this, it, this just happened. And uh, great that I could, uh, I think I, I ended up getting, I can't remember, 60, 60 odd, 69 or something. Uh, not out, and that was. Uh, I, I, if Simon had kept his head, and I'll, I, I'll tell him off till today. I should have gone on and got a hundred that day. Yeah, well, as as Glamorgan, I was actually scoring that game, uh, and uh, you can see there Terry Davis, sixty six, not out. Simon Daniels, seventy three, a stand of one hundred and forty. It actually beat a record which uh, Rodney Omtong and Robin Hobbs had set up yeah. uh, shortly before. And uh, I can remember going into the uh, into the Glamorgan changing room after the uh, after that to congratulate you. And uh, I won't repeat uh, what Rodney uh, what Rodney actually said, but there you can see uh, your innings, Terry, on the left hand side, 151 balls, and you can see, as you said, Simon slightly more swashbuckling. I've yeah. included this because actually. Um, in terms of your batting style, if you will uh, forgive me, I remember you very much as a nudger, a nerdler, a scurrier between wickets. Um, I know you were a night watchman uh, on many occasions, but if we look at that run chart, you can see lots of your runs there. Um, maybe not in front of the wicket, but you were a nudger and a nerdler. And like you said, Simon there, uh, we can see fours over long on. We can see fours over over mid off. We can see over yeah, deep over. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so these these wagon wheel, wheels do tell a story. And you're quite you're quite right. It was Phil Bainbridge then uh, that uh, ended the partnership. But I can remember getting quite excited because, um, in fact, Simon Daniels that day as a number eleven actually equaled the record mm. held by the great and the late Don Shepherd for the highest score by yeah. Glamorgan number 11. Although Shep on the day did tell me, sorry, Andrew, he didn't equal the record because I was 73 not out. <laughs> and Simon was 73 out. So, uh, but yeah. Um, talking of Shep, Terry, have you got any memories yeah. of Don Shepherd? Oh, look, I, for me, just seeing him around the the, the, the squad, you know, whenever we could uh, uh, get get him to come in the dressing room or spend some time, it was just great to uh, hear some of the stories from him. I mean, he was a legend, wasn't he? Absolutely, um, one of the great one of the great Glamorgan cricketers, and obviously yeah. a wonderful gentleman. Correct. So 1983, there you are. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a mullet there. Um, this photo <laughs> taken. Massive from mullet. Well, all right. How am I to, to talk about hairstyles? Now? But anyway, but that July 1983, um, Ivian's career starting to come to an end. And in uh, July 1983, you became Glamorgan's first choice wicketkeeper. How did you feel about that? Uh, uh, excited, nervous, because you're, you're, you're moving into some pretty big shoes. Um, uh, but but it was exciting. Uh, uh, we're full of promise. The challenge we had, of course, was that transition piece that we talked about a little earlier, where you had a small group of senior players, relatively. You had a you had a number of players that were in and out, and then you had that group of young players like myself, Jeff, Greg, Baz, uh, JD, all coming through trying to establish themselves. So it was a it was a bit of a mishmash for a few years there, and it was a it was that transition phase. So that was the challenge. But look, Andrew, you know, as a as a child, as going back to what I said right at the start, from when you're sitting at home with a scorebook, watching uh, a test match from Lords on television, and suddenly you you have the ability to get selected and walk out and play. It's just phenomenal. And I remember uh, after that innings, uh, my first championship match, where I got sixty or not out. I remember we played a back back to back match against Somerset. And I got naught. Uh, Nick won, you know, caught behind, and I remember that day uh, after that match we were travelling to Lords, uh, and I remember going up to Jarvin, and I will talk about him soon, saying, "Am I in the team?" And he said, "Never ask me again uh, if you're going to be selected until you're told you're not selected." And he, he gave me a big telling off that day, and so it was sort of the start of me accepting that. I'm in, I've got to earn it and uh, expect that you're going to want to you know, expect yourself to, to uh, always be picked and perform accordingly. 
Yeah. And as I said a few minutes ago, you were your batting, you were very steady, as I said, a nudge and a, a scurry yeah. between the wickets. But you I should have got also... more runs, Andrew. I, I should have got more runs. I should have got more runs in my career, to be fair. If I backed myself, I should have got a lot more runs. I think I averaged just under 21. I should have been a high 20s and I should have got some hundreds, first class hundreds, in okay. truthful. But I, 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 that's, my, that's my problem. But you were prepared to be night watchman as well. Oh, yeah, no, I loved it. I loved getting in against the quicks. Um, I, I loved it. I should have backed myself to be a little bit more aggressive at the crease. Uh, um, and I, if you go back, and I think the modern game would have helped me. Maybe I wouldn't have even got a look in, but it would have helped because it would have given you a, a freer flow or a bit, or mentally a, a, a freedom to, to start playing more shots, I think. OK. Well, let's just look at that. Squad. There we are. Um, the Glamorgan squad of 1984, of course, by now. Mike Selvey. Yeah. There we are yes, on the middle of the front row. Uh, Mike had been signed from Middlesex. Alan Jones, of course, there uh, in his role now as county coach, Arthur Francis and Rodney Ontong on the front with, uh, with Ponty, John Hopkins and Ivy on. Uh, Phil Carling there as... Uh, the secretary, that middle row with uh, on the extreme left of the middle row, Tudor Jones, who was the uh, hey, physio. Yeah, as the physio. There's KJ there as uh, second team captain. Eunice Ahmed, who'd been signed okay. as well. Uh, Steve Barwick, we'll come on to Baz uh, in a minute. Greg Thomas emerging. Another signing or two other signings there in the middle row. John mm -hmm. Steele from Leicestershire. Uh, fine, steady batter, left arm spinner, Charlie Rowe from Kent as an off spinner. Yep. Then we've got A.L. Jones and your good self alongside Byron Denning, the Glamorgan oh, scorer. Yeah. And on the yeah. back row, the emerging talent on the back row, uh, extreme left, uh, Jeff Holmes, Steve Maddox, uh, leg spinner, yep. Michael Can, steady batter, Ian Smith, smudger, yep. uh, mm -hmm. Russell Green, seam bowler, uh, Stephen Henderson, Hendo, Hendo uh, middle yeah. order batter, John Derrick, uh, Mark pricey. Price, mm -hmm. and of course, someone Thank now you. who I mustn't forget because he's chief executive here, but uh, <laughs> Hugh Morris. So, Terry, yeah. as you quite rightly say, a blend of youth, mm. experience, yeah. some talent there, some people, though, like you, uh, like... Eunice Ahmed, John Steele, Charlie Rose, Steve Henderson, signed from English counties. No, you're dead right. You're dead right, Andrew. When you look at that, you look at, you know, the core senior group, that front row, weren't even uh, regular. Arthur was in and out. And then you look at the journeymen, uh, the, the Eunices and the, uh, Charles and, and, and Steely. So, and then you've got a blend of a lot of, of, of young guys trying to make their way. So it's that three-tier for me, for that county, you know, when you looked at a Middlesex, let's say, at the same time, uh, all those successful counties, they would have had probably eight, nine senior players that were day in, would be, be written down day in, day out. Then you had your fringe guys who would come in and out, whereas was a transition piece during that time. Let's, let's just talk about the gentleman there, middle row, fourth from the left, Steve Barwick, uh, or Basil. Right. Yeah. Um, Baz started his career as a seam bowler and then, uh, like Rodney did as well, switched. Well, Rodney was more off spin and Baz was more off cutters, a la right. Don Shepherd. But yep. um, what are your memories of Baz? Well, he, uh, in two phases, as a, as, a, as a guy in the dressing room, he was a great guy. I love Baz. Baz was a, a great team man. Um, as a uh, and he had this freaky ability to stay fit. He had this freaky ability to stay bowling fit. And, and gosh, if I was to, you, to count how many overs he bowled, uh, and yet his body stayed intact. He was really, really, really injured. As a seam bowler, because I only experienced uh, a little bit of him bowling off cutters, as a seam bowler in those early days was one of the best. And he, he was unfortunate probably to be overlooked from higher honours because he'd get close to the stumps, he was tall, as you can see there. He had height, and he would come. He'd come up down. He would, he would get bounce and hit the seam because he 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 hit the wicket. 
and any wicket that suited his style, he would be pretty difficult to play. So uh, he was a fine. He was he was skillful. Uh, he stayed fit, so his body was good, and he was great in the dressing room. We loved it. We we, we had some great last days. Yeah, and um, after you retired in '87, uh, Baz went on to a fantastic career as a, an off cutter. Uh, yeah, he was a one of the stars in the Glamorgan team in 1993 that won the the one day uh, competition. In fact, I know that several counties actually held pre match. Uh, meetings to actually yeah. talk about the how band. they were mm -hmm. going to play because not many people had actually uh, seen an off cutter uh, like uh, Baz. Let's talk briefly as well about someone who I know you were very close to and sadly is no longer with us. Uh, they're on the back row, far, far left. Someone who you mentioned, Terry, earlier on, who was on the MCC ground staff with you. Let's just talk about Jeff Holmes. Yeah, he's a great. He was a he was a great uh, Glamorgan uh, contributor. Um, what he lacked in skill, he had in heart. He had a massive heart and had a had a massive commitment to 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 the to the team. Uh, he was a great leader. He, he he always led from the front, and he's incredibly competitive. Uh, and he was he fitted in with everyone. We all liked him. He was a great guy, and he was my roomie for a long time. And it was a tragic when I heard uh, what happened to him. It was pretty tragic. Uh, he's a uh, He's a fine, fine player, fine player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. And yeah, I can, I'm sure many people can remember those, um, those lovely lilting Geordie tones of weird. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And yeah. um, um, I think, Terry, you were keeping in um, Ebu Vale in that Sunday League game where, um, where Jeff took five, yep. five wickets for two runs or something. I think, yep. I think one day cricket was his forte. Oh, totally. I mean, uh, he would have been—he would have loved the modern game uh, 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 because it would have brought the best out in his batting. But he was an all-rounder. He was—he was a great outfield cricketer, good catcher, uh, and he bowled those uh, straight, full, slingy sort of action deliveries that were always going to be good in one-day cricket. And uh, yeah, on his day, he was—he—he he was a, just a good all-round contributor. Let's also just briefly talk about someone else on the back row, third from the right there. John Derrick, again, sadly, no longer with us. Someone who, after you retired, Terry, uh, went on to an absolutely fantastic career here, not only as a coach of Glamorgan, but uh, working for Cricket Wales and nurturing the next generation. But no, no, no surprises there with JD. He was, he was just a gentleman. Uh, and he was a sort of guy that would just be a brilliant mentor. I could imagine him. Uh, guiding uh, future cricketers, he was a lovely, lovely man. Uh, and I remember, I remember batting with him. We we put on a, a number of runs at, at St Helens again against Derby. I think he and I. And we'd always, I always enjoyed batting with JD. Uh, we 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 got on well personally, and he and and I just loved playing cricket with him. He, he, he was a nice lad. We called him the Silent Seamer as well because he he bowled a few of those phantom seamers as well. Uh, but he was a gentleman. Yeah, a great great man. Now, obviously, Glamorgan in the mid-1980s, some other emerging talent, and uh, we'll talk about some of them a little bit later, but let's just talk now again about the man extreme right on the back row, Hugh yep. Morris. Yep. Um, you played a lot in the late 70s when Hugh was coming through Young England and uh, England schools and all the rest of it. And then, of course, in the 1980s, Hugh succeeded in 84, succeeded Rodney uh, as Glamorgan captain. But um, what are your memories of Hugh, Terry? Oh, look, he, he was always destined uh, to be successful in whatever he did. And so uh, Hugh, in the early days, we used to see him occasionally studying. So he'd, he'd come in and out. But he was—he had—he had, he had a, a great temperament, uh, a great attitude, uh, and you know, for him to step up top of the order with some of the pros we had, and at a time where, you know, don't forget when we were around, the, you had the barrage of West Indian uh, fast bowlers in every county we turned around, or there was some quick running in. So Hugh, Hugh not only was skillful at the top order, he—he he had a personality type, and the way he conducted himself was always going to show that he had—he was going to outperform. And off the field, we knew that he, I knew he was destined to do 
uh, good, good, great things uh, outside of the cricket world anyway. So uh, all, all good memories with Hugh. And, I, you know, I've, I've seen Hugh post his pl our playing days and he's, as, as everyone knows, he's gone on to do, uh, to do some really uh, sterling work outside of the game. Yeah. Now, also in the mid 1980s, a, a very oh. young, um, very Matthew precocious, Lino. yep, very Matthew. talented young batter came in. And there you are with your arm around Matt Maynard. This is August the, 1985 yeah. against Yorkshire, a rain affected Smashed game. Smashed him on a turn. Yeah. yeah. Again, was, just to. Matthews left, another Glamorgan debutante there, uh, Phil North, yeah. uh, spin bowler. But Matthew, on this occasion, on his first-class debut, had gone out. Glamorgan was set a target. I think we haven't done brilliantly well. But Matthew then looked like turning the game around. And, of course, he went to a maiden 100 on first-class debut. The later and the great... Yorkshire spinner Phil Carrick was bowling and Matthew in true Cavalier fashion went to his hundred six six six. Terry it was, a, it was a brilliant innings it was it was only a bloke like him who would have been able to do it it was turning square it was a Bunsen and everyone else would have been playing from the crease trying to fend it off where Matt just came down and, and just took took it took it to the bowlers. And it, he, when they bowled at him, they bowled different lengths and lines than they would have done anyone else in that team on that day. He just absolutely took that attack apart. But it was just, it was probably, in, it, when you look back, it was no surprise. Um, I mean, I never saw the, the his great deed, Zach Glamorgan, uh, uh, after my career, didn't follow too much. But you could see as soon as he joined our county, his attitude... The way he played was more like the way Australians play than it was at the time the way the English players played. And uh, and uh, I'd have loved to see him playing in this modern era. He would have just been a superstar. Yeah, well, I think Matthew's record reiterates what you said. 54 first-class hundreds. Um, someone who probably, in terms of uh, the modern era, obviously Alan Jones in uh, his own time period, a Glamorgan great. And Matt Maynard, together, of course, with uh, Hugh Morris, a glittering record in the 1980s, again, in the 1990s and in the early noughties. And, and, Andrew, he, and Andrew, he should have played for England a lot more. He, he, was, he was top draw. He should have played a lot more international cricket than, than he did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've... Like you, I've seen a lot of county cricket, first-class cricket, and you see some of the people who've been yeah. chosen for England and they it's weren't fit to... It's a joke. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. you said that. Um, yeah. At the time, of course, in the mid-1980s, Glamorgan had as their overseas yeah. batter. Um, <laughs> I was going to say a shy, retiring uh, person from Karachi, but... Um, no. You can't say that. <laughs> David Meandad. Here he is. At, here he is at Neath in yeah. 1985 after yeah. scoring yeah. a double hundred against right. the Australians That's and it. sharing a partnership which still stands as a club record, 306 with fellow Pakistan international. Eunice. Yeah. Eunice, yeah, yeah. Now you were. Terry, you were behind the stumps that day uh, at Neath, although uh, you were sat in the pavilion, no doubt enjoying uh, Jarvid's stroke play. Well, I enjoyed two things that day. I got capped that day, or that match, and then sitting watching uh, Jarvid just absolutely tear that Australian attack apart, which wasn't a bad attack, to be fair. Um, and it was just, uh, it just showed his quality. Well, on when he when he wanted to play, and on on his day, he just killed any any attack, any volley he wanted to. Would Would you say that Jarvid was one of the best batters you ever saw? Definitely. I mean, in different ways. I think the best. I, you know, you, you I sort of compartmentalise when you you get questions like this because I'd say that Jarvid was the best batter I saw in all sorts of wickets. So. If it, on turning wickets, on, you know, slower, on seeming wickets. He was the best all-round batter I ever saw because 
again, him in the modern era, he had the ability to upset bowlers by doing unconventional things. So he would use his feet, bat outside the crease in those days. He used to, I, I remember John play a league games. He'd come down the wicket and say to me, uh, we can get 10 and over. Now, in those days, 10 and over was like, you'd never, ever dream of it. And so he was always thinking ahead and he was always innovative. So that ability, his thinking was as a, as a batsman was better than anyone else I played with. But the most destructive batsman of my time was, of course, Viv. So there's different categories of, uh, you know, of how I would sort of compartmentalise the skill base. But he was, he's definitely one of the best on all round wickets for mine. Yeah, and we were, we were lucky enough, Terry, you were then retired in Australia, but uh, from uh, 1989 stroke 1990, and then again in nine, uh, through to 1993, we were lucky enough, really fortunate to have uh, Viv in our team. And of yeah. course, in 1993, never to be forgotten, yeah. Uh, winning the Sunday League and uh, what a great man and uh, what an influence off the field I was fortunate enough to see that and the uh, the influence that Viv had on the Glamorgan team it was the icing on the on the cake um Terry you just mentioned that you got your Glamorgan cap that day yeah what did it mean to you to be a capped county player I don't I think people today would laugh but it, it, it is everything because when you try to even explain to the Australians that you you played 50 or 60 first class matches and you still had your, hadn't had your cap, they just laugh because you you get capped on your first performance here or first selection here. Um, but it, what it meant was that uh, you are now you've earned the right to be selected uh, as a regular player. Uh, it, it was a bit old school, but it, it meant everything. It meant that you'd been uh, recognised by your peers as as, as the regular uh, fixture. Yeah. Just before we move on, in uh, for those uh, on the call, that um, just to Jarvid's right there, in other words, the, the figure second left on the balcony at Neath on that day in 1985 with the grey hair uh, is a gentleman several people on the call may recognise as Cyril Walters, the Glamorgan cricketer from the 1920s, who subsequently went on in the 1930s to play for Worcestershire. And of course, at Neath, uh, there he is. So pleased to see Jarvid enter the record books. Cyril there, a former pupil of Neath Grammar School. And in 1934, whilst a player for Worcestershire, he also became the first Welshman, born in Neath, of course, first Welshman to captain England in an Ashes Test match. Uh, Tony Lewis, another gentleman from Neath, subsequently led England, although not in an Ashes test. So, Terry, there you are. Um, again, I do apologise. Um, there you are with your mullet and your very suave um, moustache. Um, 1985 was also a special year for you because um, you actually scored your career best First class, 75, I believe, against Middlesex at Sophia mm. Gardens. What are your, yeah. Have you got any memories of that innings? Oh, just that we were in trouble when I got in there. So, uh, and, that, and they were a good attack. Uh, and I like, I, you know, there's some, it's a funny thing, but there's some teams that you always enjoyed batting against. Uh, Surrey was one, Middlesex was another for me. And there was those counties that you, you used to fear. Um, wherever Michael Holding was, I used to fear. But uh, uh, now I just remember uh, being very uh, solid and brick wall through that time because we were in trouble, if I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do remember because I was actually, again, scoring that game and it was uh, yeah. an innings that helped to uh, help to dig us out of trouble. And uh, yeah, we as you, trouble. yeah, yeah. As you said, um, it surpassed your innings at um, Swansea with Simon Daniels, but... Uh, you got within 25 runs of a first-class 100, but uh, yeah. anyway. Um, let's move on to 1986. There you are. Cool. Um, again, behind the stumps, 1986, because you actually set a club record in one-day cricket in this particular match where this photo was taken. This photo actually was taken at a ground called Stone, which was in Staffordshire. 
yeah. where Glamorgan played a Nat West Trophy game. Yeah. And Terry, on this particular Remember? day, four catches and two stumpings. Yeah, that's right. And and uh, and I'm I'm angry to this day. I should have had man of the match because I, I know. Uh, had that partnership with Rodney that got us out of trouble. If you if if uh, you can recall, it was a Gillette Cup match, I think. I can't. Yeah, that was that was trophy against yeah. Minor yeah. County, and we were in trouble. Uh, we were at, we batted first, and we were struggling. We were one thirty or something for seven. I can't remember now. But and then I, I came in, Rodney and I put on probably got us to a, over two hundred. So it was competitive. Uh, I, got, I can't remember. I might have got 30 or something and Rod got uh, runs. And then I went on and uh, took six victims and then Rodney got man of the match. I was, I was really uh, angry at the end of the day, but happy we'd won that. Yeah, I, I've got vivid memories of uh, being in the company of your good friend, Edward Bevan, heading up uh, the, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, heading up the M5 to Staffordshire, arriving there. <laughs> in those days, I was the scorer on Radio Wales. Ed, of yeah. course, was yeah, the commentator with Don Shepherd. And uh, yeah, we were we were gobsmacked. I can remember coming back in the car with Edward. We were absolutely amazed that the man of the match adjudicator had gone for Rodney when uh, you had done so much. But that's a record, Terry, that is still there. Yeah. Yep, Six dismissals. Um, yep. Let's just let's just talk about the county schedule back there in the mid nineteen eighties, because of course nowadays we have four day championship yeah. cricket uh but in those days it would be a three-day game starting on a starting yeah. maybe on a wednesday wednesday thursday yeah. friday then yeah. traveling on a friday playing again on a saturday yeah. then on and a sunday early. going off to yeah. do a sunday league game yeah and then going back to wherever you were to do monday and tuesday it was horrible of, uh, it, was, it, was, it yeah. was brutal it was brutal because also i think during that period, I think uh, ECB's uh, dictate we bowled 110 overs at one stage as well. So you, you could you could uh, be at uh, playing at Hove, uh, 110 overs in a day, finishing at 7:30 at night. By the time you showered, you have to pack your kit up, get it in the cars, drive up the motorway to Old Trafford to play a John Player League game, get in at midnight, and then you're at Sunday League and back down the motorway, unpack your kit the next day and back out on the, on the field. It was, uh, I think the schedule was terrible. And, and what, it, what it did through that period, I think, and the way the program ran was that you could never play at the intensity that, that you should have done. Um, you know, I watch, and what I used to love about coming to Australia was to see how the system produced great performance. And that was because preparation uh, 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 was right here. And so when they got to the field, they were uh, at their best. So bowlers would be at their peak, batters were at the, their peak. Where in England, and you know, even with our quicks, there'll be days where they're tired and they underperformed, and days where they were good, they had outperform. And it was just, it was inconsistency in terms of intensity, where the Australians uh, are always in, were always intense, but the program didn't help help that. Yeah, I can, I can remember maybe, you remember again, I think it was 1983, uh, Glamorgan against Essex at South End uh, yeah. on the Saturday. I think Graham yeah. Gooch got a few runs. That's that right. first day didn't end until about quarter past eight at night. Now, luckily, That's right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And we Dark. were, luckily, we were playing Essex the following day. I, I think yeah. Gooch got quite a few runs on the Sunday as well. But again, well. to finish, to finish at quarter past eight, and there was another one, Terry, I don't know whether you were involved in this, where Glamorgan were playing a game at Swansea against Cambridge University on the Saturday, the Monday and the Tuesday. And on the Sunday, Glamorgan were away to Yorkshire at Hull. Were you... <laughs> I didn't, luckily, I didn't play that one, but oh, I get it. It was, it was a brutal schedule. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously... Times have changed and uh, yeah. we've moved on and obviously uh, it is a lot better. I want to talk about bowlers now because there you were behind the stumps and uh, Glamorgan during your career had, um, had quite a few fast bowlers. Yeah. Now, the man on the left, Greg Thomas, Come making on. his yeah. first class debut at the same time as you. Um, on the right there, Winston mm -hmm. Davis. Yeah. 
great West Indian. We've had a wonderful museum talk with Winnie, who sadly now is uh, quadriplegic after a horrendous accident in the West Indies. I haven't got there, so apologies to the late Ezra Mosley, another West Indian who was in the Glamorgan team around about the time. So Greg Thomas, Winston Davis, Ezra Mosey. Terry, my simple question, who was the fastest? Uh, it's a good question. Um, certainly Greg on his day had genuine, genuine, genuine pace. They were all quick. Ezra was quick on the day as well. Winston, Winston probably had more consistent pace, but what I liked about Winston, when he landed it in good areas and he was he bowled from a great height, he had high arm and he got bounced. So any, any conditions that suited, he was deadly. Greg was more of a slide bowler, so he'd slide it up at a genuine pace. And Ezra was just, uh, gosh, he was just an aggressive, fast bowler and wanted to get people out. So all, all different. And, uh, and I feel, feel for poor old Greg. I remember in 84, I think it was, when the West Indies were touring, Andrew, and they were all touting Greg was going to play uh, for England and he was the fastest bowler around. And he was yeah, genuinely scaring people. And I remember playing Somerset. We were down in Taunton playing Somerset and we had them four for nothing uh, on a uh, wicket that was suiting us. We had four slips, two gullies. And they swaggered in Viv. And I, I am certain Viv on that day came out to simply destroy Greg because of all the talk about how fast a ball he was and how much of a threat he might have been for that West Indies uh, touring party. And Viv went on that day from the first ball, I remember, four slips, two gullies, bat pad, uh, no one in front of the wicket. First ball hit the point boundary before anyone could blink. And he, he got the fastest hundred of the, of the, of the year. Uh, during that game, poor Greg was the recipient, but uh, Greg went on to play for England, uh, which, which was right. But genuine pace, um, probably didn't land it in the areas as consistently as maybe a Winston Davis did. And when he got a little bit more bounce and uh, was more controlled in those key areas. And Ezra, again, genuine pace, probably on his day could have been the quickest of all three. Uh, and was angry um, but, uh, and wanted to get people out. So all different, but I'd, I'd have to, if you were to press me, would say Winston would be the person I would probably pick out of the three if I was looking at a match winner. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I think I'm right in saying that Winston held for several years a record in World Cup cricket. Yeah. Took seven wickets, seven I think it was against, yeah. Yeah, against Australia. Yes, yeah, 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 at yeah. Headingley. And yeah. uh, a lovely, lovely man. And, oh, great, uh, great man, great man. Yeah. Well, Love I've actually him. included this photo because it was really touching. I'm speaking here tonight in the museum. Unfortunately, we're not allowed Terry uh, visitors at the moment uh, with COVID regulations. And I know you've got uh, a little spike in, Aus in New Zealand yeah. as well, but it's great actually that Greg has stayed very close to Winston and actually Greg organized a visit about four years ago by Winston here into the museum. I know quite a few people on the call were here. We had 50 or 60 people here and Winnie spoke so movingly with Greg and of course the camaraderie, the friendship, the kinship. Uh, it's Fantastic. great that Greg has kept uh, uh, an eye on Winnie and Winnie obviously is a quadriplegic as I said has had uh, difficult times, but uh, the Professional Cricket Association and others and friends like Greg have helped him through. And I know that uh, he's so grateful. Of course, Ezra, looking down from above after that horrendous uh, bicycle accident in the West Indies, which cost Ezra his life. He could, of course, Terry, Ezra broke down with a, a back yeah, he injury. Had, he had injury problem. He could, have, he could have gone on to do anything, that boy. Yeah. 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 And again, a wonderful man. Now, someone else I just want to talk about. Um, here's a, an action shot from uh, St. Helens, Swansea. Yep. 1984, this is. There you are uh, behind yeah. the stumps, Terry. Yeah. Laurie Potter of Kent is right. the batter. Jarvid there. At, Jeez, Jarvid uh, at bat pad. That's a rare yeah. one. And Rodney 
now in off spin mode. Yeah. So yeah. your memories, Terry, of uh, of Rodney as a oh, look, Rodney was a was a final rounder. Um, he was probably unfortunate not, not to have played at the higher level. Um, and I think his move from seam bowling or swing bowling to spin was an excellent move. And he was he was a good craftsman. Uh, his record will show that. And uh, and he was a big contributor. He was a, he was a match winner, uh, Rod. Uh, and uh, I used to he was always challenging to keep to because he was a big spinner of the ball, but he had a good arm ball as well. So as a keeper with an off spinner, and he was an aggressive off spinner as well. So he bowled at reasonable pace, and so he was always challenging to keep to because you were either going to get the nick on the uh, on the outside with this ball that was straight. Or it would turn on turning wickets, and uh, and you'd have to be uh, uh, concentrating all the time for those between bat pad or down leg side. So, but uh, uh, Rod, a fine player. I mean, he would have fitted in at the time if you were matching up a lot of the counties. He would have walked into any of the top draw counties as uh, as a uh, if you were matching skill or player for player. He would have walked into many of them. He was a good player, Rod. Yeah, 1985, 1986, Rodney. Uh, scoring hundreds, taking yeah. ten fers against knots, I think on two occasions. That was a great. That was a great match for him. That was seriously was would have would have been up there with any any player's performance, getting runs and uh, and bowling them out. That was a good victory for us on on their home soil up there. Yeah, thirteen wickets, I think it was in the game. It was, and yeah. his name his name went in the selectors' book. And of course, yeah. sadly, nineteen eighty eight, he and Steve Barwick uh, yeah. travelling from Chelmsford or Colchester, to Northampton for the game the next day. Uh, there was a horrendous car crash on the motorway and Rodney's knee uh, never recovered. And uh, we just have to wonder, uh, as you said, Terry, he could have gone on at the no, time no, yeah. to uh, a glittering uh, career with um, England. Terry, just want to talk there, obviously Swansea, a wicket which, yeah. would, which would turn... Yeah. Um, Cardiff back in the 80s Cardiff oh. okay it was a wicket that, was, that nowadays is improved good pace good carry but Cardiff it was a terrible back wicket back then oh my yeah. god it rolled you, it wouldn't bounce higher than your shin it was a flat low no bounce uh, pretty flat, horrible wicket to be fair Swansea was different St Helens was different and it was odd odd uh, because uh, good early it would seem a little bit settle down it would definitely turn on days two, three for sure, and uh, sometimes significant uh, spin. And when the tide came in, it used to seem late in the afternoon as well. So you know you'd play the conditions. So it was, it was. It, I used to like playing it. It was great sitting on the balcony, looking over the ocean. It was, it was a fabulous place to play cricket. I used to love St Helens. Yeah, um, Bristol Channel, mate. Not quite enough, yeah, but I know what you mean. I, I you, yeah. you're, you're in the southern hemisphere now, where, where there's lots of oceans. So yeah, That's I'll. Uh, yeah. I won't tell you off, but we'll leave um, it <laughs> in terms then of your keeping skills going to wickets, perhaps like Trent Bridge with the yep. with uh, Clive Rice, Richard Hadley, green yep. wickets and wickets with yep. more bounce, you yep. obviously had to be quite adaptable. Yeah, of course. And, uh, and also one day cricket, because you've always got that uh, balance of um, coming up to the stumps, back to the stumps. One day cricket, medium pace is getting up to the stumps. Conditions, Lords was always challenging to keep on because of the slope. People wouldn't realise uh, who are listening or watching this that the slope from side to one point of Lords to the other. So your your feet are always different. Headingly the same. The square drops off at the ends, and so the ball dips. So keeping wicket in England, and you talk to the Aussie keepers now, like Gilly, who's a mate of mine. They all talk about how difficult England is because the ball wobbles after it uh, passes the stumps. Some of the uh, grounds are different in terms of swings after the that passes the bat. And then you've got the variation of turning wickets and low bounce in those days. So uh, quite a contrast. Uh, so you have to be a good all-round keeper. You just can't be a good catcher of the ball. You had to be, you had to have an all-round skill as a keeper in those days anyway. Now we've got several questions and there's a gentleman on the call uh, well actually he can't be on the call because uh, he's got another commitment called Jeff but Jeff has submitted a question in advance for you Terry and yeah. Jeff's question is simply and um, you can choose southern hemisphere if you wish but I think Jeff was uh, 
hoping you'd choose Northern Hemisphere, but you can give me two answers if you wish. But um, <laughs> your favorite ground, which, which, which was it? Where? Um, there, is no, there, there is no shadow of a doubt, and I, I, even though it's out of uh, Wales, it's Lords, of course. Lords Cricket Ground is the, is the most, it, it just, every time you walk in those gates, the hair on the back of your neck stands up. It doesn't matter who you are in world cricket, Lords is number one. Um, and and uh, as a major venue, I think Adelaide Oval has to be there as well because Adelaide Oval is a purist cricket following and the ground suits cricket. So uh, Adelaide Oval, Lords number one, Adelaide Oval number two. Great. And if you throw a third in, I'll say Sydney Cricket Ground, but uh, that's the three. Okay. Well, um... I, I'm so pleased, in fact, the domestic fixtures, Terry, for Glamorgan came out last week and um, it's great to see that in September, Glamorgan are actually going to be playing a four-day championship game at Lords. We haven't had Fantastic. one there for uh, some time and uh, that's something to look forward to and it's always Absolutely. special. Absolutely. And uh, for the Glamorgan players who haven't been there for some time, to go through the grey skates and to go up to those changing rooms, those lovely panels, and as you say, to walk out through the long room. Um, it's, it's, it's unique, Andrew, you know, and you, when you go up and the stud marks there from past players from, you know, 50, 60, 70 years more, it's just unbelievable. It's the, the whole feel of the balcony, the walk up the stairs, uh, everything is, is, is just special. Yeah, yeah. I've got to say as well, and you're not going to be surprised, and people on the call are not going to be surprised, um, but I'm in the Mike Gatting camp, the lunches as well, the food at Lord's, Terry, wonderful. It's, pre it's pretty good. Uh, there's a big, big, big choice of stuff there, uh, food all around the clock, and the quality was high, high quality. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think in your day it was Nancy, wasn't it, who was, was. the... Yeah. We'd always nip up there and say, Nance, can you get a sandwich on any time, no problems, what do you need? Beautiful. Yeah, for the people on the call, the uh, here at Cardiff we have a wonderful selection, of course, at Sapphire Gardens. But uh, I think the Lord's catering would be Egon Rone, where you have a starter, choice of four mains, three yeah. or four afters. How people can go out Terry and play cricket after that, I anyway. Uh, but, and there is a, there is a, and the, the the challenge of playing at Adelaide is that the caterer is there, I would, and it has a traditional dish, which is the plum chicken for all of the players is a on the global calendar players wait for the plum chicken at Adelaide Oval. Oh well I'm hoping I'll be able to make it to the southern hemisphere now that the COVID regulations are easing so uh, yes. um, I'll I'll look forward to uh, sampling that Terry. Now of course well, your county career came to an end at the end of 1986 Yep. And you decided, as uh, we've, we've all heard with your, your accent, which <laughs> now is more uh, Southern Hemisphere than uh, St Albans, <laughs> but um, you decided to emigrate to yes. Australia. You had spent winters, I believe, mm. playing for Western Creek in Canberra, Bathurst Cricket Club in Sydney. We're going to talk in a minute about Bankstown, so yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, you did allude earlier on uh, about the differences between county cricket mm -hmm. and uh, grade cricket in Australia. Yeah. So yes. for you as a, an emerging and as a developing cricketer, how important was it for you to have those winters abroad in Australia? Oh, it was critical because it, it not only kept your skills up, um, you could actually watch what's going on around the world. And uh, it, it, I remember in 80, going back in 83, maybe 82, I can't remember if I'd, I'd spent a, a summer here. I remember vividly going back into our dressing room and saying, lads, we've got a real problem. Australian cricket is going to just surpass English cricket at that time. And it was purely around culture, around attitude of players, you know, as, an, as a small example, I remember, you know, how I was taught and how we were taught even when I was a coach and playing was, you know, you'd have throwdowns in the nets with young cricketers, good cricketers, and, and you'd get them to have high arm, play, play in the V, you know, 
full face of the bat, play straight, just as a throw down. So I, and in Australia, I'd do the same, but that smacked me over mid-wicket, over the fence. And I'd say, well, what, what happened? You're supposed to play straight, push it back to me and uh, keep the V and keep the shape. He said, and they'd say to me, no, he's there to hit. I've got to get runs. And so already we were seeing this attitude of, of Australian attitude of we are here to perform, play every ball as it is. Don't be afraid, no fear. Team support about no fear. Where the English system then, uh, probably different, a lot different now, was don't take risk. We want to play candy cricket forever. You're not going to get a spot, be, be, be dour, if you like. Uh, where Australians was, we get limited opportunities. As a great cricketer, we only might get a, a bat once a three, every three weeks. So we must make opportunities to get hundreds. And, uh, and also at first class level, because of their staggered program, they traveled days earlier, they practiced together uh, and they were fresh. And the intensity level and the competitiveness was, was, was at 100% all the time. And so you can even see it in this last, if you look at this last Ashes now, you can see there weren't many sessions that England won um, purely because of the intensity that that Australian group put onto that English lineup. Not to say the skills weren't good. That English team is uh, man on man are a good side, but that intensity level that the Australians br bring uh, from great cricket through to first class to international level is just, a, a, it, it's a, a little bit of a different level. I know that was then, but the, I know English cricket's changing, but that's, there was definitely, it was a, a massive eye opener to answer your question, to see what was going on in uh, down in the uh, Southern Hemisphere. As I said, you, in 1986, you decided to call time on your... Yep county career what what were the reasons look i'd always um i don't think i ever saw myself uh, as a 300 400 game player with a career as a commentator or coach i don't think that was ever in my thinking and i don't think uh and i i always i came to a point where where it was do i sign and i had a contract to sign do i sign and um in my head uh, jump the threshold, which meant if I'm going to sign another three years, I'm going to start to then claw in more years just as a county pro. Or do I in, take a step back, uh, reflect on what how great that 100 games were and that five, six years uh, Glamorgan were, and re-step re myself and take a new path? And I, was, I think I was always going to do that. And the Australian life was good for me. I'd met Noel, uh, my wife, who was still together with uh, three... Uh, children who are all grown up and we're very proud of was Australia was always going to be uh, my my home uh, uh, eventually. So it, it was just a it, it was very difficult. I remember uh, there was I think Hugh had sent out the contract to come out and Hugh Morris had sent a note about pre season and I remember Noel and I were talking about it and I remember putting the uh, letter that I drafted carefully into the club to say I've decided to stay. I put it in the post and I. I was so de I wasn't sure, and I remember standing by the the uh, post box waiting for the postman to come to get the letter back at one stage. But I, after we again conferred as a as a as a team, Noel and I, uh, the decision was made. So that that was fundamentally the decision. It was time to take a new path. Yeah, and of course we mustn't forget that uh, at the time in the 1980s and again in the 1990s, recently as well, if you were 10 years as a capped player. There would have been a benefit year, so I'm guessing, yeah. I'm guessing you having received your cap, 1985, 1995 was a yeah. a long way away, and yeah. there were good opportunities for you uh, in Australia. Well, you're right, Andrew. I think you, in your head you think uh, when you're at an age of you know 24, you can readjust and you can re you can reinvent yourself. Uh, which you have to do, you know, and uh, and that's ongoing. Even even as at today, you, you've got to be reinventing yourself in this modern world uh, all the time. Uh, but then it was a little. You, you, you could either get out and reinvent, or run that that static path of cap, ten years benefit. Do I coach? Do I commentate? What do I do? And I I, I was never. I, I I don't think I ever saw that as my my, my path. Yeah. Well, you had. An opportunity to um, join, I think they're called the Bulls, aren't they? Uh, bulldogs. We're the Bulldogs. Yeah. Bankstown Cricket Club in Sydney. So fantastic. Um, yeah. Can you just tell us? We'll we'll talk about the superstars in a minute, but 
just tell us about uh, Bankstown and the Bulldogs. Oh, they're a great club. I mean, I, I'm, I've, I've got blue going through my veins. So um, when I had the opportunity to go as, uh, as club uh, captain, to, uh, first grade captain, it was a no-brainer because Bankstown has always run through my blood. My wife's, Noel's family's from uh, around Bankstown. Uh, I've always loved Bankstown. I, I've loved the Bankstown Bulldogs uh, rugby league team in the NRL. Um, I've even had Bankstown play at the venues that I've worked at since I've gotten to play matches. So Bankstown was part of my, is part of my, in my blood. And uh, you were lucky yeah, enough, there are uh, two quite, well, quite young there. We're talking about hairstyles. So uh, a sort of pseudo mullet there on, uh, on, on Junior. Yeah, yeah. Mark. Yeah. On Mark Wall and yeah. on the uh, left there, Steve, Steve Wall, yeah. who you were lucky enough to actually um, uh, captain yeah. and nurture. Yeah, great. Those kids, well, I mean, they're superstars, these boys. And, and we were fortunate, uh, Bankstown, because there were, there, were, there were grade matches where we would have nine or even ten first class or international players in our team turning out on a Saturday in front of two men and a dog uh, against a, a, another great team. It was phenomenal. And, and you know, I'll talk about the, the talent of these guys. I mean, uh, Stephen, uh, tough, a fierce competitor, uh, never lose, never step down, uh, technically good, but not as good as Mark, but technically good, but attitude and application and uh, read of game and never say die. Fierce, 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 and great to captain him. Um, and I'll come back to a story about him as well. And Mark War, flair, just a, a, a rare, freaky talent. Uh, brilliant hands, brilliant catcher, could bowl quick, could bowl spin, had every shot in the book. Uh, best leg side player I've ever seen, best straight driver I've ever seen, and absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant player who would have loved, again, this modern modern game. But a story about Stephen, it comes back to what we've been talking about. I remember uh, Bankstown training. We used to train as a club on a Tuesday night, Thursday night, and then first grade would be Friday nights. Because everyone's working. You know, these guys are part from the pros. And um, I remember uh, Steve had been in India with the Australians on a tour. And uh, he'd got back that day. And when we we're practicing, there's Stephen. Stephen walking out to a grade practice session and throwing the ball down to our under-16s in the nets. And everyone's, you know, all these kids, of course, mouth opening, uh, couldn't even move because of Steve War, the hero, coming out of the test side. But that was how great cricket was and still is to a certain extent where these guys, that they, they parked with their success and they came in and they, they were part of the great system. And so... The, the influence that that had and the rub off on those young players was it's so infectious, but it's just incredible uh, difference that, that that made. And these we were lucky because not only those guys, Wayne Holdsworth, Scott Pressure, first class, Steve Smith, brilliant player with uh, he, he got caught up in the, the split with Packer, uh, brilliant players who all were the same in our club uh, and the other first class guys and giving and. And contributing it was incredible culture that they created those two uh, and the, they've got two brothers as well and dean first grade player and played south australian cricket and danny was a fine player as well uh, played first grade didn't quite get up to first class but um incredible sporting family and you were very fortunate terry you uh, you haven't uh, uh, said it that you actually uh, led bankstown to yes. some sydney great titles we were great. We were a great side. And it was great when these boys came in. I mean, you know, we, I had the respect of the guys, which was good. Uh, and uh, what a pleasure it is when, you, when you're when walking out with these guys to play. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it was a great honour. Uh, and it was great to captain the team. And it was great to captain the club. We were club champions uh, for a few years and we won some premierships, which was lovely. When did your playing career come to an end? Oh gosh, I'd have to have to go back a long way now. I probably I finished uh, ninety about ninety eight ninety nine, but I came back for a season in two thousand and one. I was state selector there for a year as well uh, when um, New South Wales won the Sheffield Shield. Uh, but I decided uh, just to uh, just to uh, finish off that. So I, I, about two thousand and one was my 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 last uh, my last outing. Okay, as you just said. 
you yeah. were a selector for Cricket New South Wales. So yes. um, what did that there was a bit of con- There was a bit of controversy. Involve? There was a bit of controversy around this because selectors have quite a say in team selection as opposed to England where a captain and maybe coach select. The selectors make decisions. And I remember vividly, it was my first year as the state selector. And then and the uh, New South Wales made the final Sydney Cricket Ground against Queensland. Mm. And there was a really uh, big conversation mm. around one particular selection, and it was Adrian Tucker. He was a leg spinner, um, and it was a very, very controversial selection because it was either Adrian Tucker, the leg spinner, or Peter Taylor, the off spinner, who played a lot of cricket for Australia. And, the, and, and there was a sway, there was a conversation at the select, selection committee because uh, mm. Adrian Tucker had the wood on Alan Border. He'd got him out five times in five uh, rounds. It got him out every time. Just uh, didn't pick his wrong, and he just it was just one of those one of those things. And so I had the casting vote for some reason to pick Tucker or Taylor, and I picked Tucker. And as it turned out, Tucker got uh, AB out, and uh, they went on and won the Sheffield Shield. But I remember when I was at work that day on day one, there was a death threat came into the my office because some fan of Peter Taylor had said, "There's a bomb in your office," and uh, we had to evacuate. And I had to tell my then boss. It's because I've picked Adrian Tucker. We've had to evacuate the building. Wow. True story. I remember, of course, uh, when you say Peter Taylor, everyone says Peter who? Which, that's right. It was like that, yes. Yeah, but I do remember seeing uh, Peter Taylor bowl, uh, I think it was at Neath, for, yeah. the, uh, for the Australians when uh, yeah. they came over. And uh, actually, we it's, it's quite topical because... Uh, the Australians, as we saw earlier on, played at Neath in 1985, again in 1989, and again in 1993. And actually, Terry, you may not know that Glamorgan Cricket, this coming summer of 2022, we are actually going to be playing two Royal London One Day Cup games. I hasten to say, whenever I mention Royal London One Day Cup, we are the defending champions. And uh, we're going to be going back 27 years have elapsed when uh, we last played a, a first team game at yeah. Neath against a, yes. a young Australian team in 1995, oh. which yeah. had the likes of Casper, uh, Herb, Matthew Elliott, yeah. and uh, several From others. Matthews. There was a guy yeah. called Ricky Ponting who could play as well. He was really. Uh, Dave Gilbert, I think. Yep, yep. yep. And Good Stuart Law was, Stuart Stuart Law was Law. captain. Yeah. AB, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So you. Um, in your time then as a state selector with uh, New South Wales, it was quite uh, quite an important time then in Australian cricket. Australian cricket was incredibly strong, um, and uh, it was just it was a privilege to be uh, part of that whole system. Uh, it was easy for me. I knew a lot of the guys anyway from Bankstown. It was a lot of a lot of the key first team players. But um, yeah, no, it was it was a, it was a, it was an enjoyable. A uh, year to be part of uh, selection, and uh, 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 they were they were a really strong first class team. They, were, they could have played any international team at that time. Okay, your career then um, takes you to South Australia, and yep. uh, the ground there, the Adelaide yes. Oval. I, as I said a few minutes ago, I've not been lucky enough to go there, but I know the iconic scoreboard yeah. there. You'd expect nothing else from me as the Glamorgan scorer, but an iconic scoreboard, the cathedral in the background, and your um, your role, Terry, as uh, marketing manager for mm. South Australia. Just just talk us through your uh, yeah. your role there. So I had the this grand vision of uh, cricket administration lifting a game around the two thousand uh, uh, Olympic Games, and so I thought, what an opportunity to move into cricket. Because at the time I was working for a multinational out of Sydney and Melbourne. It was Adidas, the, the company owned brands like Adidas, Dunlop, et cetera. And they were moving me around that business. And I, I thought, this, there's, there's an opportunity to get into uh, back into cricket in some form. So I joined uh, SACA as, in marketing and sales role uh, and ended up 15 years later as chief ops uh, manager. And I was acting CEO for about a year before I got I left to go to Melbourne, but the transition. When you look at that picture, there, it's, it's it's a completely different world from that picture to the ground as it looks today, and which I was part of that redevelopment um, uh, and capital investment around the facilities. Because 
we had uh, we put up lights, we had grandstands built, and now, of course, with the new grandstand, there was about three quarters of a billion dollars spent on the upgrade of the facility. So it was an exciting time to work at SACA because they controlled the venue. But during that time, there were a lot of moving parts around um, AFL football coming back into the city. So the politics about uh, funding new redevelopment, it was an exciting time. But Adelaide Oval hasn't lost, in actual fact, it's in, enhanced its appeal and beauty uh, uh, to attract cricket and for, for international cricket to be played there. It's a, Andrew, when you come down, we'll certainly get you a personal tour of that scoreboard, which is incredible, and uh, of the back, back of house stuff. You, you, you will be nothing but impressed. Thank you, Terry. Um, obviously, here at Sophia Gardens, we've undergone a similar redevelopment yeah. with the ashes coming here. And uh, I'm glad to say the, uh, the character of the ground, although the capacity has increased significantly up to 16,000, but the river end, uh, the trees that line the taff, Terry, that you probably would have gazed at when you were behind the stumps trying to catch yep. those balls from Winnie or from Ezra. That's it. Or standing yeah. up to uh, to Rob, watching Viv, watching Viv hit the ball over the fence. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we've still yeah. we've still kept that, and uh, quite rightly so. Um, yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing here at Sapphire Gardens we have diversified into our other events, uh, yeah. conferences. We'll talk about that in a minute with your yeah. current role, but um, musical events as well. We've got yeah. fireworks here, Sapphire works. Yeah. Uh, to yep. give it its name. But am I right in thinking, Terry, that when you were at South Australia, um, possibly for some of the people on the call, they would never imagine me uh, mentioning the pop group ACDC. Is, is that Hang right that they were there? Absolutely. We, well, we had, I think, one of the most memorable, uh, and, I, and I built a, a really strong relationship with those music promoters during my time there, which has helped me uh, in good stead in my role since Adelaide Oval. But I think the most memorable show we had there was Michael Jackson. Um, that was the best performance we saw at the stadium, but the best attended was uh, Akadaka, ACDC, the one you were talking about. We sold, I think we sold 67,000 tickets in about 10 and a half minutes. So uh, it was a phenomenal event. Uh, uh, and that, that tour in particular was, was incredible. But look, the nature of stadia in this day and age is you cannot survive on sport and certainly one code of sport. It's a business. Uh, and uh, as many other stadia around uh, the world, we're tasked to deliver economic benefit for the city and the region. And hence why you need to be looking at conferences, conventions, uh, concerts and other unique events that drive people into your area to spend money. Yeah. And I know there are some cons. Well, there's a concert coming up here in Cardiff and... Uh... Yep. The uh, obviously here with the Millennium Stadium, uh, Cardiff yeah. Castle, there's also the Cardiff City Stadium, St David's Hall. So we we aren't uh, we don't have sole rights over the music, but it has been great uh, to see uh, other events here. And I'm sure as we uh, we all emerge out of the COVID restrictions, we'll see more. Well, your career then, I think, Terry, in yep. 2011, if I've got my notes right, in 2011, your career took you to Melbourne and to the uh, Etihad Stadium. Yep. Of course, uh, we know Etihad in the UK as a name, as a brand, but in Melbourne, what, uh, what was your role? So uh, it's now, it was the Docklands Stadium, so it was a complete renovation or redevelopment of the entire Docklands of Melbourne. Um, and my, my role, Ian Collins at the time, Ian Collins was uh, previously a chief executive of uh, the Carlton Football Club. AFL is like a religion in uh, Melbourne. Uh, and he uh, said to me, because I was acting chief executive at uh, the SACA, uh, I was probably in my mind uh, thought that I was gonna get the CEO's role uh, there, but uh, a gentleman called John Harden Pit me at the post and John had, in fairness, John had uh, headed up the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane and uh, had great credentials. And at the time then Ian said, come on down here, come in as our chief ops uh, manager for the stadium. And, that, it, and it was a big business. We're talking, you know, at the time then about 190 million in revenue. Uh, so it was a significant chunk. We had 50 days of AFL football 
they were starting to talk about uh, 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 cricket, T20 cricket being a house for T20, one of the T20 teams, concerts, etc. Uh, and so I went there, but it was a short stay there, Andrew, relatively, because I'd always, after the experience that I had over not getting the CEO's role, I knew that I needed to get CEO experience. And I, I, that was a piece on my wish list that I needed to, to overcome. And I knew also that I'd, I'd had to jump to a regional stadium to get that uh, chief executive officer experience uh, but even though it was a very senior role there um, I was I was running some significant commercial deals with everyone we dealt with I knew I had to leave so I only did a very short stint there and then took up the role here in New Zealand. Yeah before we go to New Zealand uh, a yeah. couple of things just am I right in thinking there that there were indoor one day internationals at the, uh, at yep. the Etihad yeah so the, the, the roof, as you can see, top there was retractable. So it would, it would, it would be retractable. The challenge we had was the design of the stadium uh, didn't suit the, uh, the sun setting and rising. And so in, our, in, in the corners, each of our corners of that stadium, we could never grow grass. And we were forever having problems with AFL and the players' union because they were concerned about uh, hamstrings, knee injuries. And we spent, in one year when I was there, we spent two and a half million dollars on turf replacement alone for that one season just because we couldn't grow grass so the retractability was great but it didn't in actual fact it didn't quite deliver what it was supposed to deliver yeah i think uh, i think here in cardiff we we might have the bragging rights over retractable roofs terry and i think you have without a shadow of a doubt yeah at the uh, millennium stadium principality stadium or many on the call might still refer to it as Cardiff Arms Park. But uh, I know we, Glamorgan in the early noughties, there were some games that were staged uh, in the Millennium Stadium, but the configuration, as you said, of the stadium wasn't quite uh, suitable for the uh, for staging cricket. There were some exhibition games. It was, Terry, the only game where I've ever written 12 down in my scorebook because there was a special regulation brought in for one was that if you hit the roof hit the roof yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, that was uh, that was interesting but wasn't quite cricket mate wasn't quite cricket okay you also had a spell terry with um yeah. um the south australian tourism commission so yeah talk us through that so I was in transition to, to, to this role and the, the government called me in to talk about, uh, because I'd, I'd been quite instrumental in being creative at Adelaide Oval and, and driving economic impact with a number of projects. They called me in to, uh, uh, to look at the, the major event program that they had and provide some input and advice around uh, um, uh, budgets, around sponsorship and about uh, uh, the true impact of what we were bringing in. Uh, and, and at a time, it was a challenging project. I had the Tour Down Under, which is a cycling event. And any, any of your listeners or viewers can, can look it up. The year I happened to ha have to re review this was when Lance Armstrong came to uh, uh, actually uh, be part of that program. Uh, was the biggest success of all time for the event. And we got him down and, uh, and we had incredible support. But I don't think we would have gone anywhere close if we'd known... <laughs> As it transpired uh, with what what he had been doing throughout that time, so uh, but yet yeah, that that was a short contracted stint in my role before I came down here, just to assist them in in a review of their major events. Yeah, and of course uh, it's a reminder as here in Cardiff the uh, the huge economic spin off massive. of major massive. sport, and uh, we know here Terry the the massive impact of the two thousand and nine Ashes, the twenty fifteen Ashes yeah. that were here. And again, ICC Men's World Cup staged here in Cardiff in 2019. I know you you were lucky enough because we did meet briefly when you were over, and uh, you probably right. didn't recognise didn't recognise Sophia Gardens. But of course, sport now is so so important in the economy of South Wales in this deindustrialisation phase where um, Cardiff, over a hundred years ago, would have been known for the export of coal. Things going out of South Wales and of course nowadays it's all about people coming in, tourism, hotels, leisure and enjoying top class cricket and top class rugby. We're about to start on the Six Nations Terry coming up. The, uh, yeah. the uh, Welsh rugby team will be playing shortly and of course 
we're so pleased here today with the announcements of uh, the hundred fixtures here for Cardiff uh, for the summer. Uh, the uh, the Welsh Fire team, which uh, will be playing here, and what a great great spectacle it was last year. Well, let's and Andrew, just... that, e that, that economic impact uh, story is real, though, isn't it? We when we host All Blacks here, um, it's around fifteen million uh, of economic impact. We know in this city, uh, and it was a little different in Adelaide, but we know in this city when the All Blacks play here, uh, and when there's concerts, around seventy percent of tickets sold come from outside of this city. And so that spend is uh, incredibly significant. And we, we spend a lot of time, there's a lot of science around us um, uh, ensuring that we're right across those economic impact numbers, because as you said, it's a, it's a key reason why cities invest in stadium. Absolutely. Well, let's just finish this part by talking about your, your home since 2014. Yep. I know, uh, we were saying earlier before we started, you and Noel uh, having been uh, Australian, you, well, you're a, an adopted Australian and in 2014 to move across the Tasman to uh, become chief executive of Dunedin Venues in yes. South Island. Um, just just tell everyone in what, what exactly does Dunedin Venues comprise? So we're, we're tasked, uh, uh, we're owned by the city, we're a CCO, a council controlled organisation, uh, 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 although we have an independent board. So our board is, has been tasked to be entrepreneurial and to drive as many events through our facilities as, the, as we possibly can to do two things. One is that economic impact piece and secondly, a pride of city, because Stadia um, not only provides that pride of your region when an All Blacks test match comes or Ed Sheeran plays a concert or the Rolling Stones come, uh, it means that they don't have to go out to Auckland or to Wellington or to Sydney uh, and spend their money to see that show. So that Pride of City piece is important. At, at my business, we've got around 50 full-time employees and on a uh, All Blacks night or a concert, we employ about up to 1,500 uh, staff. Uh, and so we're a key driver, not only, not only from jobs, but from new money coming in. The, the stadium on the left is is only 10 years old. Um, uh, it cost two at the time, which is uh, cheap as chips, $224 million uh, was cost to build. In today's money, it's probably 750 million and Christchurch at the moment are battling to get a new stadium up after the, uh, their, the, the challenges they had around the earthquake. Um, they're, they're touting 500 million, but it'll be a billion dollar stadium uh, by the time they build. Um, capacity 30,000, but Fred Sheeran, when he toured here uh, last tour, we had three days of concerts that sold more tickets than residents of the city. Uh, and it delivered $46 million into Dunedin. Uh, the facility on the right is our conference convention center in the town hall, which we look after. Our conference business is quite significant. And there's a, our ticketed concerts like um, uh, Jimmy Barnes and there's, uh, you know, the Wiggles, and there's lots of different smaller comedy shows and uh, et cetera. And we're also tasked with uh, Dunedin Railways now since the uh, since COVID has hit to manage our tourism rail operation. So I've got a team that looks after rail. So all of those products are really tourism tied. Uh, our host tenants here are the professional rugby team, the Highlanders. Uh, they, they attract around anything around 15, 16,000 per match. And the All Blacks this year, fingers crossed, may host, and we're hoping we'll host uh, the Irish here this year, maybe Argentina, but we'll wait and see. And I know once we come out of uh, our, uh, our current uh, 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 pandemic issues on restrictions of getting in country and mass gathering, we'll have probably four or five major concerts later in the year. So again, we, we, all of those small operators, hoteliers, restaurateurs, are desperate for us to get back into business. Uh, because they need to see that money flow. And the name of the stadium, is it Forsyth Bar? It's Forsyth Bar, Forsyth Bar Stadium. It's and a beautiful stadium, transparent roof. Um, it's not retractable, but the it's like a greenhouse and our grass growth is incredible. So uh, we strip the turf back on an annual basis and it recovers within literally six weeks and you'd think it was, uh, you hadn't touched it. It's it's incredible facility to grow turf. Uh, and 
we, we, we deliver all sorts of events. We're working with New Zealand cricket at the moment about high performance internal. So because we've got a roof, we're going to, we're looking to develop um, grass uh, practice wickets all year round. So it gives the black caps a chance to get into uh, facilities in the middle of winter in New Zealand, which is impossible where Australia has a chance to go to Northern Territory or up to, uh, to Queensland, top of Queensland. We need to give them some help. So we're looking at, we're talking, we're doing some really innovative stuff around uh, sport. And also we're just about to partner with AJ Hackett. I'm not sure if any of your readers or viewers will know there's a bungee, we're putting a bungee in the stadium from the middle of the roof. You can bungee down to the halfway line. So that's uh, quite an exciting project as well. Yeah, forgive my ignorance, but Forsyth Bar, who are they? They're a financial institution in uh, 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 business in New Zealand. Uh, their home office is in Dunedin. And they've been here since day one. We've just re-signed with those guys for the next 10 years. They're a great partner of ours. And uh, without them and their other core uh, commercial partners and our members, uh, we would be struggling through this absolutely bleak and horrible period that we're in. Yeah, I guess uh, I know at Lord's uh, recently there's been a partnership with JP Morgan. So I'm, I'm guessing there's some synergy, uh, Terry, yeah. there. But uh, you're... Uh, you're a very lucky man to uh, to be involved then. Obviously, you've been there for nearly eight years, so you clearly are doing a, a good job. Now, we've got some questions. I've got four questions just to finish on, which have been uh, submitted in advance. And uh, Howell, who is now on the call, I know he's been doing some beer tasting uh, earlier on but Howell great to see you uh, great to see you on the call and Howell has actually asked what was the most important part of your experience with Glamorgan which has helped your subsequent success in both Australia and New Zealand it's a good question uh, and I'd, I'd probably put it down to uh, resilience I think as a young player uh, leaving home in those old days to travel to Glamorgan uh, to find my way through not only uh, uh, new squads each year, so there was a people skill that you had to learn. There was tenacity of being away from home as a young player. There was the living with the ups and downs of a professional sporting life, so managing good days and bad days. Uh, they were the key lessons, probably. So it was how do you work with the people you have? How do you embrace that team spirit and get teams to work for a common goal? It was about how do you how can you structure your workplace like sport in a preparation mode? So how do you prepare and train and uh, here at strategic planning? Uh, and then uh, how do you execute? Um, not dissimilar to sport. Uh, all that if you're prepared well, you're mentally fit. If you get to field and your your team's good and you're all working well and working together, then you can ex execute your plans. Great answer. Now, Howell's also uh, asked a follow-up question, which uh, is, do you think the opportunities to reach such heights in sports and event management would have been available to you in the UK had you stayed? No, nowhere near it. Impossible. And I recognised that very, very early. Um, you know, uh, it was always in Australia, like the playing, uh, like like cricket, like sport uh, and business, here you're judged on performance purely. It's purely about how do you work, what's your work ethic like, are you a good person, how does your team rate you and how, what's your output. In, in England, it was about uh, where did you, uh, where were you educated, where are you from, uh, uh, battling through the ranks, being held back always through other reasons rather than performance. And that's why I always saw Matthew Maynard as a, as a more Australian, because I remember Nets when he joined us in the Nets. And we'd say, he can't play, he's a slogger. Only because our culture was, they've got to do it like we do it. Keep him in his place, because the senior players know better. Uh, if he takes my spot, I'm out of a job. Where Australia is, Go and do it. It's great to see innovation. Let's learn from the innovation. If he comes and gets 100, it means we all benefit. Give him a chance because if I'm not good enough, I shouldn't be playing anyway. It was like, and that's the same philosophy in business as it is in sport, as it is uh, uh, for, for the balance for both countries, the, di the difference. 
Great answer, Terry. As I, as I knew you would. Great answer. Now, John, who's also on the call, has asked, in hindsight, was there anything in the preparation and training you could have done during your time as a Glamorgan player that would have made you even better? Yeah, I think uh, I think that the culture of cricket. Uh, I, I think I would have I would have been far more comfortable, and I think uh, I would have uh, 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 adopted my game better in this current era uh, than then. I think again, culturally, county cricket was us and them. Senior players had their own dressing room; young players didn't. And the battle uh, then versus an Australian system, or as maybe candy cricket is now, I can't comment, is it that it was a more inclusive process from uh, training, or signing, training, mentoring, mental health issues, uh, support for home, and then skills that it, it, that, it, that it was now than it was then. Then it was, you're in, I don't know how to help you, good luck. <laughs> and fighting against all of those, the, the system, if you like, and the, and the culture. Yeah, and I'm sure Glamorgan was no different to the other. No different. Uh, no. Of course, in the, I was going to say the other 17, but of course, Durham oh, totally joined. It, it, absolutely, it was totally, it was, it was just the way it was. It was the yeah. way it was. Okay, well, John has also asked another question. It's the final question, Terry. Uh, yep. For us this evening in the UK, but for you uh, uh, in the morning in uh, New Zealand. But the final question from John is, as a cricket administrator... How important do you think it is to have played cricket to first class level? Yeah, it's a good, it's, a, it's an excellent question because we debate this all the time. Uh, I think when I first started, I would have said it's critically important because you need to feel the subtlety of the game. I think the longer you go and you can see the evolution of cricket, and I've got to say, cricket is ahead of a lot of other sports. I'm critical of rugby at the moment from the administrators, because rugby, and this will answer your question, is that rugby is governed and administered by past players. And hence why you, what you will see is the game has to be like it was when I played or when I was watching the game. And it puts an anchor in the water where if you have an independent uh, model where there's, it's based on skill set through your administration, independent boards that are based on skill, whether it's commercial, legal, there's a different optic around the betterment of the sport or the individuals. And cricket's a good example. Um, rugby isn't a good example because you, you need to be innovative, entrepreneurial. You need to be changing your view on your audience. Uh, rugby still caters, and I see it here. They cater for a white-collar male, 50-plus. Uh, we, we need a product that caters for women, men, families, kids, and it has to be a different product than you're putting on the field. So to answer your question, I think in the early days, I would have said it's good to have a feel for it. I think quite the opposite. I think it's about the right skill that drives that product that meets customer needs. Same as any multinational would be uh, under what, what any multinational would be operating. Brilliant. Well, Terry, it's coming up to nearly uh, nine o'clock uh, UK time. And uh, I have to say, the two hours have flown by. You've given some very frank. You've given, as I, having known you so well, no surprise at your honesty, some very refreshing views on the state of sport and uh, marketing. And uh, I'm sure, uh, and don't forget, we're feeling slightly bruised here in the Northern Hemisphere after the... Uh, the 4 nil drubbing for the Ashes and uh, all sorts of paper talk at the moment uh, about change. But as you said, the England team that lost down under was a good one. There are, there are a lot of talented players there and I'm sure the administrators here in the UK will not be wanting to throw babies out no. with bathwater. Um, Terry, hugely informative this evening and I'm so pleased, and I'm sure everyone on the call will uh, agree with me, how great it is to see how your career uh, has taken off. I know a lot of people will have um, will remember you, uh, albeit briefly, uh, six or seven years in the spotlight with Glamorgan, but you've uh, 
you've clearly uh, set uh, a very high standard, as I know you always did uh, when you were keeping wicket for Glamorgan, but you've set a, high, a very high standard in your business career and obviously best wishes to Noel and Thanks, your uh, your three youngsters who uh, yeah. uh, do they support Wales or uh, are they uh, are they they're, they're, unfortunately they're Australian through and through oh yeah sorry okay well and, and Andrew just for mine I, I've got to say uh, what a great contribution you've made for Glamorgan cricket as well uh, they, they should be very very uh, pleased with your performance and the the, the you know the loyalty you've shown, they should just be, you know, you, you've done a great job. Thank you, mate. And uh, obviously, when we worked together for Glamorgan, I was mixing my teaching career. And in 2005, I had the great honour of coming here to work full time for this great club, setting up the museum, working on these museum talks. And it's been a real pleasure tonight, Terry. And thank you for your, your kind Thank you, work. mate. And I'm sure I'll see you in some, either there or here in the future. Thanks, mate. Absolutely. Well, I'd just like to thank everyone for logging in this evening. Just to say that um, I know when we had our last uh, talk in December with Kieran Carlson, I was saying about having some in-person meetings here. But uh, as I alluded to with the, the COVID bugs that are floating around, we uh, unfortunately uh, have to play safe at the moment. So our our talks for February and March will continue to be in a virtual mode here by via Zoom and I'm hoping I'm in discussion with Colin Ingram our uh, over star overseas player from uh, South Africa I'm hoping James Harris as well who of course has seen the light of day and has decided to uh, come back home to uh, Glamorgan I'm hoping that we can have similar talks with Colin Ingram and James Harris in the coming months. There will be details shortly on the Glamorgan website of when those talks are going to be uh, staged. I will say that when I last spoke to everyone about a museum talk, we were hoping to have a tribute evening to someone who Terry remembers, uh, Peter Walker, wonderful yep. fielder, wonderful broadcaster, and right, actually man. a wonderful man who sadly, of yep. course, is no longer with us. But we do have plans and Hopefully, once the restrictions uh, ease, we'll be having a function here in the museum here at Sophia Gardens with Peter's family. And I'm sure many of the people on the call this evening will be able to come and join us and to raise a glass in memory of, uh, of Peter. So more, more details soon. Just to finish in terms of the, the housekeeping, I know several people on the call this evening have been uh, asking about the Glamorgan yearbook. It is going to be published as usual in late March. I spent a little bit of time this morning just finishing off the proofs. It's nearly there. And as I say, details will be appearing on the Glamorgan website fairly soon. But to finish, it's a huge thanks to Terry for taking time out. I know Terry is, uh, I'm sure everyone on the call will understand Terry is hugely busy, but Terry, thank you so much for taking time out to uh, share your thoughts and your memories so i just have to finish by saying good night here from sophia gardens in cardiff where of course you graced uh, the glamorgan sweater with uh, high honors so terry it's been a real pleasure thank you so much on behalf of everyone on the call and everyone else will be logging in online to watch this so uh, thank you so much good evening good night and thank you so much Thanks, Andrew.